All right. Thank you all. Good morning. Thanks for joining us for this webinar on smart sensors and the world of Industry 4.0. I'm an industrial control specialist for Turtle & Hughes in Newburgh. Um, you all have my contact information, but I will be sending it with the notes and the recording after this. Um, guys, if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to interrupt and ask. I will do my best to answer. If it's not something I can answer, then I will include it in the notes um, with the recording after this. I understand a lot of people probably couldn't join because of the weather as well as Thanksgiving. So let's begin. So when you look at a typical shop floor uh, or plant floor, really from start to finish, from raw material to end product, you're going to see a lot of sensors. You'll see inductive proximity sensors detecting the presence and, and counting um, gears uh, for metal. You'll see limit switches that are uh, withstanding contact from certain tar target objects. And you'll see a lot of photoelectrics and analog sensors as well. Um, so really when you think about it, nothing happens in a plant floor until something is sensed. And um, the Aberdeen Group is a group that did a study a few years ago in 2015, and mostly the focus of the study was the effect of safety on productivity, because typically people think that if you're implementing safety along a plant floor, then productivity is going to take a hit. It's actually the exact opposite. One of the other things that they noted in there is, and this is going to be a direct quote, the first step every company should take, no matter the industry, if they truly want to achieve operational excellence, is to get control over their manufacturing data. Effective decisions are always based on data analysis and information, not speculation or conjecture. This is no different from manufacturing-related decisions. So really, when you think about it, you're going to need data, and that all starts with sensors. They are the source of the most critical shop floor data. And so if you want to get into the industry of world, uh, <laughs> the world of Industry 4.0, you're really going to need some of that contextual data as opposed to just the on-off digital signals that you typically get with a sensor. <laughs> This is showing you a basic overview of Rockwell Automation's uh, portfolio of sensors. You have the photoelectrics, which are mostly what we're going to be focusing on. But you also have proximity sensors, such as a couple of these guys that are actually enabled on IO Link. They're going to be smart sensors. You also have analog, so pressure, uh, temperature. And um, the, the rest of these are RFID tags, encoders, and um, actually code readers, which is says coming soon. Um, I have a prototype. If anybody is interested, I'd love to show it off. It's really cool technology, but typically we're going to be focusing on these guys, the photo eyes. So one of the things that's going to be included in the notes is the present sensing brochure. A lot of you already have this, as I've, I've taken this on a lot of sales calls and other um, sensor boot camps and that kind of thing. But um, this just gives you a decision tree in order to help you with the selection process of your sensors. Uh, we're not going to be talking about safety, but we do have a full line of presence sensing safety devices, such as light curtains and um, interlock switches. We also have limit switches. If contact is tolerable with the target object, rule of thumb is to usually use a limit switch. It's just basic and easy to program and uh, kind of off and running with those guys. Um, really, again, we're going to be talking about the photoelectrics, um, what we call smart devices, which are IO link enabled um, photoelectrics. So I just want to take you on a quick tour of a new tool that they've come up with on alanbradley.com. Um, type in ab.com, use this for all kinds of things. You can search up here for bulletin numbers and keywords, and you can get product profiles, technical documents, wiring diagrams, the works. Uh, but really what I want to show you is if you come up here to tools, you go to the sensor selection tool. Um, unfortunately, they are right now undergoing maintenance, which is why you'll see it's a little bit zoomed in and not formatted correctly, but um, this gives you a nice overview of, you know, a, a very basic way of going through sensor selection. What's your target object? And it doesn't have to be exactly the same. It doesn't have to be a whiskey bottle. If you have a different bottle application, you can always start there, and it will take you on a selection process that basically tells you, you know, how can you mount it, um, you know, what are you sensing, and, and things like that. And again, this is undergoing maintenance. Um, it's constantly being improved, and they're constantly adding um, target objects and other technologies to this. So it's a work in progress, but it's a really nice way of starting your selection process, and it'll bring you up to the configuration software so you can continue, uh, you know, coming up with a part number. So um, really, again, we're going to be focusing on these guys, photoelectrics, for the most part in this. 
So you might be asking yourself, what is IOLink technology? Um, it's non-proprietary to Rockwell. This is something that's industry-wide. It's worldwide. Um, when you see this symbol, you know that it's a smart sensor. It is IOLink enabled. Um, basically, what this is doing is instead of just giving you the on-off signals that you get with a typical sensor, which could be, you know, there's not a, a, a target object present, or it could be that the, the sensor is just not detecting it because low margin or it was sheared off of the, of the line. IOLink technology is giving you the ability to see low margin, proximity alarm, something's getting too close. Um, you're going to see the life of the sensor in terms of hours since usage and since first installed. Um, so when you see this, you know that you're going to be getting something that can act as a typical sensor with the same part numbers as you typically would have, but it's going to be forward and backward compatible. Essentially what that means is you install the same sensor that you have had. That, that photo eye is going to give you the same on-off signal, but once you hook it up to what we call an IOLink master, you're going to be able to program that in the same environment, the Studio 5000. You'll set parameters, and you're going to be able to get those things like low margin alarm, um, proximity alarm, and things like that. And it's also going to tell you that, that that sensor was actually cut as opposed to, you know, having just the off signal, which could be anything. Um, another thing that you want to look at is these are going to use the same cables as standard sensors. So not only are you going to be using the same sensor that you would have even the analog sensors are going to use, instead of the shielded expensive cable that you typically have to use for an analog sensor going into again, an expensive analog input module, you're going to be using the same cables, same IO link master uh, for analog and digital. So a couple of the advantages, but again, IO link is non-proprietary to Rockwell. It's something that's been around since the early 2000s. But most companies didn't know how to utilize the new data that's being delivered by the smart sensors. But with Rockwell, with our smart sensors, IOLink masters, and panel views, we're not only able to deliver that data into the logics controller, we can also have it displayed in a neat personalized dashboard that organizes this data. This way, everyone from engineers to operators can access information from the plant floor and react to the disturbances accordingly. It's really all about cutting down on downtime. A lot of people don't have that scheduled downtime. They're running three shifts constantly and, and can't afford to have, you know, a day set aside where they're reprogramming or teaching or anything like that with the sensors. So this is really beneficial when, when talking about reducing downtime. How does it work? Again, you're going to be using the same cables, with four conductors. You're going to have your in, your ground. You're going to have the communication or the, you know, the output. But really what, what's coming out of the fourth conductor is where the magic happens. This is going to be the standard I.O. You're going to be getting your on-off signal. So if that sensor is cut, you're just getting that off signal. If you realize down the line that, hey, we want to get some more information, we want to know where that sensor is, which part number it is, where in the line it is, is that sensor you know, 1 or is that sensor 21? Um, you're going to be able to hook this up to the IOLink master and, again, program it in Studio 5000. And you're going to be getting more than just that digital on-off signal. You're going to be getting what, where, why, and sometimes how. So that fourth conductor is where this IOLink magic happens. This is especially helpful if you're already using point I.O. or armor block for on-machine I.O. You simply install the master, set your parameters, and you're off and running with that critical data that helps you foresee the machine issues before they take place. Um, this is a chart that you're going to be able to find in another piece of um, information that we're sending with the notes. This is going to be the, the smart sensors on IO link brochure. And again, that's going to have a little bit more information on uh, what we're talking about today. So more often than not, the adoption of smart sensors and IO link systems is driven by the end user. However, a lot of OEMs like to provide a good, better, best suite of options for their end users, and they're beginning to offer upgraded systems that include smart sensors, IOLink masters, and, you know, in the, the panel views um, to display all this information. This is in order to provide a data-rich environment that results in preventative and predictive maintenance for the end user. Others are simply using the same Allen Bradley sensors that they always have with the knowledge that if more data is desired at any point, an IOLink master can be installed to have that same sensor deliver more than just the on-off digital signals. You couple this with an HMI, and you're delivering a whole new user experience that details what's going on in their machines, as well as when, where, and why. And 
you know, again, we're talking about predictive and preventative maintenance. Ultimately, the goal is prescriptive maintenance, showing you what happened, you know, why it happened and what you do about it. But when you're looking at, you know, lower cost of total ownership, and that it, these are all kind of no-brainers for the end user. It's really about the the OEMs being able to say, you know what, it's it's really it's not too much of an added cost. Um, again, the IOLink um, master is a little bit less expensive than your typical analog IO, um, and you're cutting down on the on the shielded cable, you know, for your analog applications. But there's a lot of flexibility, and really, I mean, you're, you're cutting down on a lot of risks when you talk about an IO uh, an, an OEM adopting. IO link for some of their future projects. Again, this is something that is typically included in a good, better, best. Do you want this information now? Do you want it down the line? Or is this something that you want up front to um, you know, get the, the data that we're talking about today? So go through some of the, the benefits. I'm not going to read this word for word, but um, some of the cooler things to look at are with the armor block IO, which this is the part number you would use. That is going to give you event time stamping. So if something gets sheared off the line, it'll tell you exactly when. Um, input time stamping. So if something, you know, it's basically cataloging what happened and when. That's going to be available for the armor block on machine IO. Um, you're also going to get across the line, you'll get things like real time diagnostics and trending, which is nice for again, you know, coordinating and correlating what's going on in your machines, when and why. Um, it's going to give you descriptive tags. So when you, when you, you know, plug this into the Hyolink Master and you go to the program and on Studio, you're going to see, you know, actual parameters. You're not going to see parameter set one. You'll, you'll be able to, you know, detail and name each one of those um, categories. It makes it a lot more, uh, a lot easier to troubleshoot and it's uh, good for personalizing the, the data when you put it onto a dashboard. One of the cooler things, though, is the automatic device configuration, which we'll go a little bit more in depth. Essentially, uh, a lot of people are, are, you know, familiar with this in terms of the uh, drives where you have something fail, you take that same part number, plug it into the same port, and you're off and running. It's downloading it from the controller. This is good for if you have a third shift or you just have operators that you don't necessarily trust to troubleshoot and program um, sensors. It's a good way of just take that same part number, plug it in, downloads the configuration, and you're off and running. So we'll go through a couple of these benefits. Real-time diagnostics, again, this is showing you the sensor health so if something is, is constantly, you, you may have cleaned the sensor, but the margin is still low, it's going to show you the low margin. And you can set the parameter to, you know, say it's at 30%, that's when you want to know, and you can go and, re and replace that sensor. Um, it'll let you know when it's damaged, um, if it's misaligned. It's, it's, if you have a transmitted beam where you have the receiver on the other side of the conveyor line and something shook it a little bit, it vibrated or it was moved by an object, it'll tell you that's out of line, somebody needs to go and reset it. And um, again, this is cutting down on downtime as opposed to just not detecting things. And then you have to figure out what the problem is, send somebody out there to see which sensor it is. You're seeing these alarms both from your PC as well as the HMI. So it's really, uh, really beneficial when you're trying to cut down on that downtime again. Automatic device configuration. So let's say that this 42JT photo eye was cut off the line, and this is 3 a.m., you have your third shift going, an operator that you don't really want to go in and teach a sensor. You're going to see on the HMI that actual part number. You can go into the profile of it, see the part number, and because I know you all have critical spares because you're all responsible and you take those critical devices and you put them on your shelf, you take that same exact part number, go over to the shelf, you just bring it right over to the same port that you would have hooked up to either the armor block or the point I.O., and what happens is the controller is actually going to download those configurations based on that port, based on that same part number. You're going to have those configurations automatically downloaded, and you're often running in the same context that you were before. So this is really good for not only sensor replacement, replacement, but you know if you don't have the most competent workforce, you want to be able to know. You know this is giving you peace of mind at four in the morning that that sensor may have failed, but you have somebody who can just plug it in, and you're off and running. Multiple profiles. I'm uh, just going to briefly touch on this one. This is basically if you have a set number of, we'll call them recipes, where you have, um, let's say Copenhagen has a bunch of different uh, chewing tobacco, and they're all in different colors. As opposed to having the red line go, and then once the red line is, is stopped, go out and teach all the sensors. Now you're going to be, instead of detecting red, you want to detect blue. And, you know, 
pausing the line, going out and having every single one of those sensors taught to detect blue, you can do that from the profile in the HMI. You're just going to select profile two. Now you're all looking for blue, set that line, and you're off and running. And it's a lot better, or a lot more efficient and quicker than going out and teaching each individual sensor. So a place like Copenhagen is somewhere that has implemented an IO link and uh, they've benefited greatly from it. Um, again, this is sort of uh, going into the recipe aspect of it. Um, data time stamping, and this is currently only available for the on-machine armor block. Uh, but this is going to show you, you know, all the inputs, um, whether something you know was detected, whether it's counted, you're going to be able to get all that information down to here's hours, minutes, seconds, and we have six digits of milliseconds. So we're getting really into the dirt when it comes to when it happened, so that it'll help you troubleshoot why it happened. And again, it'll tell you whether this sensor has you know is is no longer there, as opposed to just that off signal that you have up here. Remember, connected and off. This is still showing that it's there. If something was sheared off, here's what you would see, and you would know that the sensor isn't detecting anything because it's not even there. Trending is very useful in terms of um, knowing, you know, if something was, was about to set off a false trip, if somebody was walking too close to the other side of the conveyor line, or if an object was drifting um, too close to the, the detecting, uh, detection area, this will tell you, with this you know, orange line, that something is what we call the proximity alarm. Something's getting too close. It's about to trigger, and you don't want it to. Um, this will also show you when the margin is getting low. So if something is drifting out of that range of detection, it'll start to give you those, those low margins. So if you're supposed to be detecting at a foot, something is approaching from you know, two feet away, you get a, a proximity alarm. If this is starting to drift away from a foot, then that's going to give you the low margin because you're not picking up as much light as was um, previously. The, the firmware enhancements, um, some of these, the newer ones, the 42AF and the 42EF included, um, they'll actually download the firmware updates automatically. And so if it's connected to the master, it's already going to catch you up with the firmware of the master and the, and the PLC, um, just keeping you up to date. Uh, it's just another one of those, you know, low uh, maintenance options. So just to give you an idea of what the IO link masters look like, here's the point IO one. Um, you have the 4IOL, which is going to be the 4 IO link sensors. The 4IOLK is the same thing, except it's conformally coded. Um, right now they're in the works of doubling this to 8IO for a different option. And, um, you know, again, this is something that you, if you're using point IO, you simply plug it into that uh, Ethernet module and you are off and running. Um, and the add-on profiles we already touched on, but that's a, another way of just easing the, the programming of these. This is just going to give you a brief, uh, a basic topology. And again, we want to show you that this is, you know, a laser measurement um, analog sensor. We have a, a simple proximity sensor, another analog pressure sensor, and even a color sensor. They're all going into the same IO link master. So again, these are going to be using the same non-shielded, regular, typical IO-Link cables. Um, same here with the, the pressure sensor. And you have a, up to a roughly 60 feet uh, maximum from the sensor to the IO-Link master, giving you a little bit more flexibility than you might realize. Um, having you know, all these completely different sensing technologies going into the same IO is hugely beneficial to reduce panel space. And again, when you're getting this information, even from a simple inductive proximity sensor, uh, more than just on off, it's, it's really nice to get that data. And again, bringing you into the industry 4.0 world, you're going to need some of that data in order to make the decisions that, um, that you're looking to make. This is showing you the armor block. Um, if you're using the on machine IO, this doubles up the number of sensors. And again, this is going to give you input time stamping and event time stamping. Um, this is also, you know, they're in the works of making this a 16 point um, IO link master. So that should be out shortly. And again, this is just giving you a, a basic topology, showing you that you can have the photoize, the, the laser measurement analog, pressure analog. You have the splitters as well that can, that can double up your inputs. Um, you do want to have a, a power supply with this guy. It's going to be standing alone. Um, some of the devices that are out now um, that we're getting pretty excited about, 
the distance measurement is a cool one. Um, this is actually, you can set two different parameters. So say you have a window between two feet away from the sensor and four feet away from the sensor where you want to detect things. You want two different windows. You can set multiple windows so we can detect things um, at different distances out. Um, this is just giving you a little bit more flexibility from your typical analog uh, measurement sensors. The 42 AF is going to be replacing, a lot of you um, are familiar with the, the Series 9000, those big bulky sensors. Um, this eventually looks to replace it. Right now, um, it's basically the big brother of the 42 EF. But what they have right now is the photo, um, the polarized retroreflective transmitted beam, which are two of the most uh, you know, reliable technologies that we have for sensors. And then you see BGS, which is background suppression. What I'm more excited about is background reflection, which is essentially instead of background suppression, which tells you a background and you ignore everything after that, what background reflection does is you, you teach the background and anything before that, it, anything that interrupts that light is going to be detected. It's actually going to use that background as a reflector. So it doesn't matter if it's clear, shiny, if it's round, it, it cuts down a lot on um, what you typically see with a diffuse sensor in that it's not relying so much on the target object, it's more relying on the background to reflect. So finally, we can actually reliably um, point a sensor down at a conveyor line and have it reliably detect all the objects going through. Um, the fiber amplifier, this is something that, um, you know, typically when people are using fiber optics, it's for high temperature or if it's, it's um, you know, you don't have access to the machine in order to set up a photo eye or, or you know, your typical sensors, these are going to give you a lot more access to those, um, those hard to reach places. The thing with the fiber amplifier is the other reason that people typically use a fiber optic is for high speed applications. Right now we have to keep in mind that the IOLINK masters are roughly five millisecond reaction time that's adding. And so for the time being, if you're looking for the high frequency, high speed counting and, and other applications that you typically use a fiber optic for, we're not gonna have those set on IOLINK just yet, just so that we can catch up with the reaction time. However, if you need the high temperature or you have very low access to the machine or the objects being detected, fiber optic is an excellent choice for that. Um, the polarized light array is also pretty cool. Uh, you see the four different beams. What they mean by beam blanking is say you have like a rope or a string and you always want it detected, but you don't want it to set the output. Let's say we blank this third one, but anything, you know, bundled up or if there's an object on there, you still want those top and bottom ones to detect it. You can actually blank out any of these so that it'll only detect a certain object and not, and ignore what you already want to be in the, in the field of view. Uh, the CLR is the color sensor that teaches up to 12 colors. It's a lot of fun to play around with. This is something that we would use for that Copenhagen um, example, where you would take the uh, you know the different color cans of snuff and set recipe so that you can actually program it from the HMI or the um, actually on this in this example you can use it on the sensor itself. You can set those um, from you know line to line, but typically you're going to be doing that from the HMI or the PLC. Um, we do have the high temperature uh, sensors that are now on IOLINK. And um, again, these are all shipping now. So there are a, a bunch that are coming out. And I want to get anybody's uh, hopes up with those AFCs. But right now, these are the ones that are shipping. And um, I mentioned earlier the 48CR, which is the code reader. Really cool. Um, you get up to 100 codes within a single frame um, detected in, in under a second. It's a really cool thing to play around with. If, again, if anybody is interested in that code reader, I do have one as a sample right now that I'd be happy to come and show. Um, just let me know and I will set something up. And uh, other than that, this is really the resources. A lot of these are going to be included in what we um, have in the notes for the recording for anybody who wasn't able to join us this morning. And um, I'll also be sending over my contact information one of the rules of thumb is, you know, again, if if you can if you can go through the selection tree, we're not talking about safety, we're not talking about the limit switches, but if you can figure it out from the selection tree, come up with a bulletin number, you can also use the sensor selection tool, or a lot of people are happy to just, you know, call me with their application and I'll help you solve it. One of the things to note is that there is really no one way to you know, solve a sensor application. A lot of times people are using a combination of sensors or they're using a sensor technology that they've never heard of before this application. So 
Um, just something to keep in mind that this this technology of iLink is still, you know, it's in its infancy stages. We're still figuring out exactly how to use all the data that we're getting now. And um, so, you know, we're all learning together. So if you have any difficult applications, I'd be happy to look them over. Um, it's something that we're all confident that we could we could solve with IOLink or another one of Alan Bradley's sensors. So um, with that, uh, does anybody have any questions? Hey, Kaiser, this is Lorenzo. Hey, what's going on, Lorenzo? Hi, yes, I have a question regarding the IO points um, on a point IO rather and the on the master module that takes the information from the devices. Can you can you go back there? Talk about yeah. the point IO? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Uh, so how many devices can you plug into this and are the connectors? So from the sensors, I assume that the cables are all flying lead yeah. on the on the connector side. So how many sensors can you actually hook up on one of those? So right now we're limited to four on each one of the I.O. Uh, modules. Mm. And if you needed more than that, I mean, there are the, you know, the, the armor block on machine, which, again, if you're already using point I.O., you want to stick with the point I.O., and you would have to get a separate, you know, a, an additional module for, for any more than, than those initial four. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the time being, they are limited to four I.O. link sensors. And, again, they are in the works of coming up with the, the eight I.O.L., um, which will obviously double that. But for the time being, we're limited to four on the point I.O. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Any questions? Any uh, tricky applications for us to solve? Well, fine. With that, I think we are uh, all set. Like I said, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I believe you have all my uh, contact information, but I will include that in the notes that we send out with the recording. And um, if nobody has any other questions, then I thank you all for joining us. And, um, you know, again, please feel free to reach out if any uh, applications come up. Thanks a lot, guys. Enjoy the weather. Uh, drive safe and have a great Monday.